Good morning. Welcome to St. Mark. If you're a guest here with us, um, love for you to plug in. There are these things called connection cards right in your pew racks. If you have a special prayer request or you want to sign up for a once a week email from St. Mark, uh, please do use those. You can fill them out and you can place those in the offering baskets as they come around. You came on a special Sunday. Maybe you didn't know that, but you came on a very special Sunday. It's special for a couple of reasons. One, is that we have um, some of the grades of our school risen savior. They're gonna be singing in the service today. The second thing is that you actually came on um, a festival. It's a festival Sunday, maybe you didn't know that, kind of like Easter and Christmas, but a little bit smaller. And this is a festival Sunday called St. Michael and the Holy Angels. Now we're gonna talk a whole lot, of, a, a lot more about that during the service. But right now, just a sneak preview, you can think about this if you're a parent, is one of the things we know about the angels is that angels have a special interest. Jesus taught us this, that angels have a special interest in guarding children. And here at St. Mark, we love children, so you, you have a chance at the, if, at the end of the service, there's going to be a special blessing for children. So if you want your child, say, eighth grade and younger, if you want your child to know and have the church pray over them and be blessed. You can see that you're, you're going to be welcomed to come forward, and we're going to do that at the end of the service. You can, no pressure, you can think about whether you want to do that or not, but we are going to offer a special blessing for children at the end of the service in remembrance of St. Michael and the Holy Angels. We're going to begin with an opening song that we actually have learned from the angels. In the Bible, the angels sang a song about the Lord, holy, holy, holy. And right now, you are invited to join the song of the angels.
Christmas always comes on December 25th, and St. Michael and the Holy Angels always comes on September 29th. It just happened to land on a Sunday, so we're celebrating the angels. Please stand as we move into that even a bit further. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Praise the Lord, you his angels. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. You servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own grievous fault. Therefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grants you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we're going to invite um, the children who are going to be bringing us Christ here this morning to come forward and, and sing.
We're going to join in praying here uh, the traditional ancient prayer that God's people have prayed on this day. Please join me. O everlasting God, who has ordained and constituted the services of angels and men in a wonderful order, mercifully grant that as your holy angels always do you service in heaven, so by your appointment they may help and defend us on earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson for today is Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to read this, this lesson here, and I'd like you to pay attention to a rather massive teaching that the Apostle Paul gives about angels in verse 16. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The word of the Lord. At this time, I want to invite you to please stand out of respect For the words and works of Christ, who is the Lord of the angels. And we're gonna we're reading this, as you'll see at the end, because Jesus tells us about the special care of the angel for children. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated, and uh, you're welcome to join in singing the hymn of the day, and I think you'll understand why it actually is the hymn of the day.
Well, I, I, I'm not smart enough to plan this, but those of you who have been around at St. Mark know that we're in a sermon series on Jacob, and I'm not smart enough to plan it so that the scripture lessons line up, but it just so happens that we're in the story of Jacob, and the next lesson is, guess what? All about angels. Well, here it is. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mayanam. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. But now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. For I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea which cannot be counted. He spent the night there. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, who do you belong to and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third and all the others who followed the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him and be sure to say, Your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. The word of the Lord. I think that we should all be suitably reminded today that the world is stranger than we can see. It's always been that way. We get out our telescopes, and there's always more. You can do the difference between Hubble and James Webb. There's websites all about it. The world and the cosmos is so much more. Actually, we can see that it has so much more depth than we might notice. Somebody, somebody said to me this, this past week that the difference between something that is God-made and the difference between something that is man-made is that when you put it under a telescope, the things that God makes become more interesting as you get into it. Because you see a cell, and then you see what's in the cell, and then you see what's inside of that. It becomes infinitely more interesting the more you get into it. There's more 
then you can see. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was really interested in that. He said, let me tell you about Jesus. In Jesus, all things have been created. It's all by him. It's all for him. Let me, let me just kind of check off the list. The Apostle Paul says, here's Jesus. He made things in heaven. He made things on earth. He made things that are visible. He made things that are invisible. And it's the invisible part that he spends the most time on. And of course, it's the invisible part because we can't see it. He says there are orders, whole orders of angels that you can't see. Today we talk about them, and we're going to talk about, I think it's perfect actually. Christians celebrate Christmas at the darkest time of year. To remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. Christians always celebrate Easter in the spring to remember that life with Jesus always springs eternal. And Christians have historically celebrated Michael Moss. Christ plus Mass or Christian service equals Christmas. Michael plus mass or Christian service equals Michaelmas. Today is Michaelmas. We celebrate Michaelmas soon after the fall equinox to remember that as the world gets darker, that Michael and his holy angels always win. So today we talk about angels. We're going to talk about the visibility of the angels. We're going to talk about the invisibility of the angels. And then finally, we're going to talk about the indivisibility of the angels. The first thing you got to notice here is that very obviously, this is so kindergarten, but God for a moment made the invisible angels visible. See, Jacob, Jacob is suffering. Jacob is suffering in a relationship with his brother, where his brother said a whole lot worse than, I would, you know, my brother's dead to me. He actually said, his brother said about him, I will kill, this is a quote, a direct quote, I will kill my brother Jacob. And he meant it. It was a death threat. And now Jacob was going to have to face it. And the very first thing that happens to Jacob when he faces this threat on his life is angels met him. Actually, the Hebrew text says that the angels fell on him. Some of you who lived in the 90s might say it this way. Jacob was touched by an angel. Actually, it should be plural, he was touched by angels. Now, the significance of that, how do I help you? Down in New Orleans, you can go into a cemetery. There in the cemetery, there is this sculpture. It was done by a man who suffered the loss of the love of his life his young wife. He made a sculpture that symbolized it. Today it's known, and you can see copies of it all over the United States, it's known today as the angel of grief. It's a picture of an angel that is perfectly collapsed in grief over the top of his wife's body. And it is a reminder that angels are perfect. They are perfect in their compassion. They are perfect in their love. 
They are perfect in God's protection. They are so holy. They are so powerful. Jacob recognizes it. He sees the angels, and this is what he says. He says, this is the camp of God. He sees the angels, and they speak God to him. These, this is the camp of God, he says. In fact, he says it's a camp. It's ordered. There's a hierarchy. There's a whole host, as the rest of the Bible says, vast and large and numbered and ordered, all of it. Jacob says, there are angels. Now, I don't, know, I don't know a better way to drive this even deeper into you except to say, here's a little story. The story goes like this. There once was an archangel named Michael. Remember, I told you that there are ranks in angels. Michael's the top one, the prince of the angels. As the story goes, war broke out in heaven. What happened was another one of the archangels rebelled. It was an archangel who wanted to take the place of God. And so there was war. Michael and his angels fought with the devil and his angels. And Michael won. Michael won so that the devil and his angels were thrown down out of heaven, down to the earth. That's how the story goes in the book of Revelation. And it tells you two things, not one. The first is that Michael and his angels are stronger. They're stronger than the devil and his angels. The second is that we know from the story that one-third of the angels followed the devil. But we also know from the story that means that two-thirds stayed with Michael. There's more with us than are with them. Which means that there's plenty of angels. There's enough angels so that there's an angel that rides with your kid in the car. And they are also your insurance policy on your house that you can't see. They are right here in church with us right now. And they also help your pastor during the week. There's enough of them that the Bible says that they depose kings. And there's also plenty to influence national elections. And do you know what honor the holy angels get? It makes sense when you think about it. When you die. See, the angels are spirits. They live in the spirit world. When you die, your soul, your spirit separates from your body. The, the Bible says that when you die, the angels have the glorious job of taking your spirit to God. So yeah, the Bible says there's angels. Now there's something that I really think you need to get from this that I want to press on. Michael is better than Satan. <laughs> and there's more with us than are with them. Which means that there actually is more good in this world than evil. Oh, that's some good news for you! 
Martin Luther reflected on this. This is what Martin, I love this. Martin Luther, he was reflecting on this. This is what he said. He said, ponder in your heart. Ponder this. Ponder in your heart the whole course of nature and of this whole life and survey every kind of person, cattle, birds, and fish, and you will find more good than bad things. And you will also see that there is a very small part that is subjected to the power of the devil. That is such good news. If you are a person who thinks more about the devil than holy angels, if you are a person who thinks more about your sins than the forgiveness of them, if you are a person who feels more in your body creeping death than the eternal life that is coming for you, I have some good news. There is more forgiveness in the world than there is sin. There is more life in Jesus Christ than there is death. And there are more angels in this world than there are demons. Which makes it, in my view, highly probable that what Jesus was talking about was guardian angels. Because there are enough angels when it comes to the littlest Christians among us that it's one to one. It's one to one. And they don't need to go through the bureaucracy. And they don't need to cut any of the red tape. Jesus says, oh no. They go straight to the Father and the Father sends them right back because Jesus loves kids. Now, what should you do with that? Well, let me, let me put it like this. There are two possible spiritual problems when it comes to angels. The first, the Bible says, is that you think too little of them. In other words, you read the vast portions of the Bible. This is just one. And you don't see them in your life anywhere. The other is that you think too much of them. You think so much of the angels and their holy help that you stop thinking so much of Christ and all of his help and you downgrade Christ. Now I'll tell you, I got a hunch that our biggest problem today is that we think too little of them. I have have yet in my life to meet a Christian who's obsessed by angels. So probably what you need to do is think more of them. When I was a little kid, my, my parents had a painting in the home. It was a painting of a little boy and a little girl. In that painting, the little boy and the little girl were standing on a bridge. And they were there over the water. And the little boy, and I have little boys at home, of course it's a little boy, is the one who is leaning a little bit too far. And there in the painting, you can see what we can't see. There is an angel. There are angels, Jacob says. Now, this was encouraging to Jacob, as you can imagine. You can tell it was massively encouraging to him. And you can tell because the very first thing that he does after he's touched by the angels is that he reaches out to his brother. He reaches out to the man who had a death threat in his life. He was encouraged. I got angels with me. I can do this. So he had, God sends messengers to him, and then the text says, he sends messengers to Esau. He was encouraged. For a minute. (laughs) Because then the messengers come back, and they say, you know what? Esau didn't say anything. Uh Uh-oh. He didn't say, you're coming back, brother. I can't wait to give you a hug. You're my twin. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. 
And the second thing, the messengers come and they say, there's 400 guys with them. Which is kind of like saying, here's what's, here's what's coming, 100 Humvees and guys with guns. Because 400 was the, was the proper number of a military unit. Uh-oh. And you can tell, what happens psychologically and physiologically is that Jacob then curled into a little ball. The Bible says, the Bible says this, I'm going to find the quote for you, that he had, quote, great fear and distress and anxiety racked him. Now, I want to say two things about that. I want to be balanced, so I'm going to say two things about it, not one, and I would like it if you just pay attention to both. The first thing I want to say is that is completely understandable. What was Jacob supposed to think? His mother, Rebecca, had told him, I will send word to you when Esau cools off, when he forgets about it. No word had ever come. What was he supposed to think was going to happen, especially when all of a sudden there's guys in Humvees with guns coming at him? What was he supposed to think? This is completely understandable. The whole thing is completely understandable. His, his, his spiritual response, his, his response with his ac- actions, because what he does is he divides, he divides himself into two camps. He's Mahanaim, two camps. He becomes two camps. This, of course, makes sense. It is the old Christian thing that all of us realize that it, when, when it comes to life in this world, we are called to use all of our personal resources to combat the problem. If your body is sick, you need to see a doctor. If your soul is sick, you need to see a pastor. And if, you're, if you've got an army coming at you and you don't know if it's for you or against you or whatever, you do the ancient desert tactic, which is this, as dark as it is, it takes a while to kill people. And so in a massacre, what you can do is you split up the group. And so while they're massacring half the group, the other group might just get away. And so that's the first part. This is at the very least understandable. But here's where the problem comes in. My question to you is this. What in the world happened to the angels? Where did they go? You know, the the text is begging you to think about it. There had been two camps. Jacob said it himself. It's May and Am. There's a camp. There's Jacob's camp. And then there's the angel's camp. And then what Jacob does is he splits up his camp into two, May and Am. What happened to the camp of the angels? Where has it gone? Answer. Absolutely nowhere. Jacob just forgot about it. Oops. Oh, it's such a thing. It's such a thing. The Bible, the Bible makes it clear that there's a couple natural and good responses to angels. One of them is that you get scared. <laughs> right? The, you should get scared. The angels, the angels, right? The angels show up to the shepherds. What happens? They get scared. This is a natural reaction to angels. If you're responding appropriately to the angels and there's a natural response, you should get scared. The second is that you obey them. Mary obeyed the angel. Joseph obeyed the angel. Hagar obeyed the angel. Lot almost didn't obey the angel. And because he almost didn't obey the angel, he almost got swallowed up by sulfur. So yeah, when the angel says jump, we jump. So there are natural and good responses to angels. The one response, according to the Bible, that you should never have for angels is the one Jacob had. They became invisible to him. (laughs) 
Here's an application to that. Ready for this? Don't. <laughs> there's, a, there's a movie on Apple Plus. It's called Greyhound. It's a war movie. It's a war movie about a war hero. You want an encouraging movie? Here's an encouraging movie for you. War hero movie set during the time what Winston Churchill called the battle for the Atlantic. And it's a story about this war hero who is leading a convoy during the time of the U-boats. And if you know anything about the time of the U-boats, you know that the Germans were killing thousands of thousands of thousands of soldiers in the Atlantic. And it's said that if you were leading a convoy, you would literally have seconds to make a decision of life or death for the convoy. Anyway, the movie is called Greyhound, and it's about this guy who leads a convoy. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happens in the movie because I kind of sort of want you to watch it. But I will tell you this much. Even Apple knows what made that man a hero. See, it shows him during the scenes. And then it shows him in the climax of the movie. Everybody's on deck and they're cheering for him because they had got through it. And they had survived hundreds of soldiers on deck and the man goes below deck and he goes down by himself and he did what he always did. He got out this little book. Now I got to tell you, when I got to this part of the movie, I got to tell you, my eyes got wet. You watch that one? My eyes got wet. And it wasn't because Tom Hanks was so great. And it wasn't because the music was so good, though I liked it. It was because the man got down by his bed on his two knees and he grabbed his little book that he always grabbed and he prayed words that my dad prayed with me every night when I was a kid. And he prayed words that I pray every night with my kids. He prayed words that millions and millions and millions of people in our church have prayed in war, in hospitals, at beginnings, at ends, in the middle, and everywhere in between. Because they are words that we are taught to pray in our small catechism. And the end of the prayer goes like this. Let your holy angel be with me so that the wicked foe will have no power over me. Amen. That's what gave him courage. He didn't forget, but Jacob did. I got one last little part. I want to talk about the indivisibility of the angels, and I hope you'll hang with me just a little bit further. Because the angels did go with him, even though Jacob didn't realize it. Now, there's a lot I could say about what Jacob does next. He splits himself into two camps. He sends gifts ahead to Esau. I want to, I'm going to hold myself back. I want to say a lot about that. I'm not. I'm only going to say what Jacob said about it himself. Jacob said, these are to pacify him. All these years later, 
all these years later, Jacob was ridden with guilt for what he had done to his brother. He felt he needed to pacify him. I want to tell you something amazing. It's more amazing than you know. You are guilt free. You are forgiven. There's got to be a Jacob in here who doesn't quite get that. You're forgiven. Do not carry what God hasn't asked you to carry. Jesus carried it. You're guilt free, no matter what. I want to tell you how amazing, we're talking about angels, I want to tell you how amazing that is. You don't know how amazing that is. So let me tell you how amazing that is. Jesus has never, and he will never, forgive the angels who sinned. It's not happening. There is no forgiveness for the devil and his evil angels. It's not happening. That's why hell was made for him. It wasn't made for us. It was made for him. There's no forgiveness. There's no redemption plan. There's no salvation. Jesus didn't come down here to be an angel. He came down here to be one of us. There is no forgiveness for the devil. There is forgiveness for you. It's more amazing than you know. which means that the holy angels can go with you. They are indivisible to you. That's what angels do. They help you when you most need help. You can see it in Jesus' life. Jesus is there 40 days in the wilderness. He's starving, and what happens at the end of it? The holy scriptures say, that the angels attended him. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. There he is at the climax of his life. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. Literally blood is popping out of his capillaries because he has so much blood pressure going on. So much pressure on his life. And the Holy Scriptures say that an angel came. There's one pastor who, I don't think this is a hyperbole to, to him. One pastor said that, quote, quote, when he gets to heaven, first I shall look for the face of my Lord. Priorities, right? First I will look for the face of my Lord, and then I shall inquire for the angel that came to help my Lord in the hour of his agony of Gethsemane. And then, of course, there's this. The very next thing that happens is that a dark host comes. And what we're told is that there are not two camps. Why not? Because Jacob had, Jacob had all his family with him. He had all his guys with him. Jacob, had a, Jacob actually had a camp. Jesus didn't have a camp. They all abandoned him. He didn't even get the other camp. He said it himself. This is what he said. He said, quote, Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels, which would be, by my math, 72,000 angels, which to put that in perspective, by my math, is 20 time, 29 times as many U.S. Navy SEALs are in active service in the, in the armed forces right now. They were his to command, and he didn't. Which means that what actually happened in the life of Christ is that all along the way, the angels helped him up to the point of death, and then the angels let him die. 
which was actually the point all along. Because Jesus died without the protection of the angels so that you would always have them. And that's your God. God's own son dies for you. And God's holy angels fly for you. God's own son redeems you. And God's holy angels rescue you. So, on Michael Moss, here's your takeaway. Just like Jacob, you go on your way home. There will be dangers on the way. All along the way, it's true that he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways until you don't need it anymore because you have finally taken your final flight home. And the angels have carried you on their wings to immortal light where you as the Lord of the angels and our Lord too teaches us, will finally be not as an angel, but finally made like them forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's you who's given us something to celebrate today. We celebrate that there is more forgiveness in this world than sin, more life than death, more angels than demons. Lord, comfort us, raise our hearts, and give us celeb celebration on this holy day. Amen. Please stand, and let's confess our faith this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, the offering plates will come around, and you are welcome to take your connection cards and place them in there.
Please stand for prayer. We do have a, a couple special prayers. We're going to be praying for um, Emily Holtzeder and her unborn child. And um, then we're also going to be praying for our small groups that are going to be starting um, coming up here um, at St. Mark. Let's join together in prayer. Remember, Lord, your holy church. May your holy angels watch over her and guard her. Grant her peace and unity throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember our synod president, our district president, and all pastors, teachers, staff, ministers, and servants of your church. Strengthen them in the true faith and enable them to teach it well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember our president, our public servants, and all in our armed forces. Guide, bless, protect, and uphold them in honor. Bring all nations into the ways of peace and justice. In your kindness and love, grant us seasonable weather and an abundance of the fruits of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we know that you look with special care on mothers and their children. Send your holy angel to be with Emily Holtzeder and her unborn child. Tend to her pregnancy, and according to your will, Give life, health, and strength. During this time, we also ask you to care for Galen and Emily's souls. Give them faith, Lord, and hope. Lord, you have called us as members of the church to loving community. As our small groups look to start in the coming days and weeks, knit us together as true family, that we may be known, encouraged, and loved in Christ. We ask that you now hear us, as we pray the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congregation may be seated at this time. This is kind of a little bit of a risk for a pastor. You never know if anybody's actually going to come forward. But if you're, say, a, um, a family with children eighth grade and under, you are welcome. And I would love it if you consider coming up. No pressure coming up. And there is a special time of prayer and blessing at this time for any children that would like to come forward. And we'll just kind of gather around. Yeah, make space. You don't have to sit down. You can stand up. That way we can move. Keep standing so everybody can kind of move around. Yay. Come on in, crowd in. Maybe make space going that way. This is awesome. Crowd in, everybody. Yay. What a nice group. Maybe back up this way. We got to get more people in here. And everybody's going to get a blessing. Come on in. Don't be so scared of me. You can come. I don't. Come on. Everybody's, everybody's standing like, all right, that's great. You can come right up here. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. You can stand right there. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, see that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you, their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Ever mindful of our Father's care for the young, we offer our prayer on behalf of the youngest members of our church on this festival of Michael and All Angels Day. Hear the words from the Gospel of Mark. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Let's all pray for our children. Father in heaven, bless the parents of these children, that they may cherish the children entrusted to them. Make them wise and understanding. Enable their children to grow in grace and knowledge of you and surround their families with the light of your truth and the warmth of your love. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. Once I bless you, you can go sit with your parents again, okay? All right, you can go ahead. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. I hear my boys over here losing it. <laughs> the Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. All right, guys. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, yeah. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen you in the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. The Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, strengthen in you the gift of the Holy Spirit and bring you to everlasting life. Let's pray over our children. Almighty God, look with favor upon these children. Grant that, being nourished with all goodness, they may grow in faith and life until they grow to the fullness of maturity in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We're going to close our Michael Moss celebration um, with a hymn of praise.
like God? It's a question, actually. And a provocation. Because Satan said, I am. And so Michael says, no, you're not. There's no one like our God who saves like him. You can go with so much hope today in your lives. Here you go. Uh, first of all, thanks to Risen Savior for being here. All uh, your parents and, and families and kids, so thankful you're here. Second of all, um, small groups are starting up here at St. Mark. We'd love for you to be a part of one. If you want to sign up for one, you're not signed up, you can find sign-up sheets right out there in the Welcome Center. They're on your left as, um, before you head out those doors this morning. Um, men's, men's group, there's a men's study coming up October 12th. I wanted you guys who are interested in that to just make note of it. October 12th, 7.30 a.m. So you have most of your Saturday there. Um, you can check that out. Uh, then finally, this is my last announcement, then you hand it off for one other quick announcement. You are all, of course, welcome to stick around for Sunday school and for stuff in the lower level. Um, we'll be doing some more teaching down there. Love for you to hang out for that. Um, last announcement for today is from our treasurer, Paul Holtzeder. And um, then I think he's got something else and we'll be done. All right, thanks, Pastor. Uh, five weeks ago, I stood up here and we kicked off together campaign 9250, which was our campaign to eliminate the debt here at St. Mark for the Narthex Welcome Center that we had added 22 years ago. And our goal was to raise $9,250. And we would get a matching grant of $9,250, and we hoped that sometime in October we could pay off that debt. Well, you probably, many of you read the results, but I had visions that I might be up here in the first part of October saying, boy, we're getting close to our goal. We need just a little more money. Can more people participate? What happened was, as it states in the bulletin, blessings overwhelming. On our 50, we actually raised, we've now received over $16,000. That's 70. <laughs> and a couple people that walked in this morning told me too on the way in, oh, we've got some extra contributions for the campaign. So we're even gonna have a little more. 
So over 70% more than our goal. Who would have ever expected that we'd be blessed so richly? Out of thanks to our God for blessing our campaign, can we give him a round of applause and thanks for blessing our campaign? Now, just a real short history on that debt. When we completed that narthex in 2002, our debt was 210000 It took a little over nine years, and we got rid of a third of it. We had it down to 140000 And then another just under nine years after that, by 2020, we had it down to 70000 So we had a third of it left. And now, in just over four years, we've eliminated debt. And that's just tremendous. And I just got to tell you that... We were very impressed with two things. First of all was the number of gifts that came in for that campaign, that there were so many St. Mark members that participated, but also the extreme generosity of some of those gifts of people who were motivated to help us to reach our goal. So let's give uh, the, all these donors, too, a round of applause for everything that they did. You know, seeing what's happened in something like that campaign is uh, sure makes me awful excited uh, and uh, positive about what our future is here at St. Mark's Ministry and our potential to spread the gospel in the, in the Mankato area. So thanks again for all that. And then the last thing Pastor said, I had one more. Oh, Arne's got something here. And then after, after Arne's done, then we want to get just some volunteers up here with the stage now, we're going to be doing our communion a little different. So if I can get like 16 people that are willing just to come up here for about three minutes and stand, that'll help us after Arne's done. Thank you, Paul. My name is Arne Kind. I'm one of your elected council members, and um, I've got, I'm, I need some input from you. I'm going to tell you about a couple of things that we're planning right now. Um, we, of course, you know, we, we have Bible class after church services, and uh, our we use the off pastor often uses the, the, the projection screen and the whiteboard uh, during his lessons. We also have meetings down there, whether it's ladies aid or whether it's the church council or maybe small groups will be meeting down in our basement as well. And uh, things are not set up the way we would like to have them set up. And this is our plan right now. And we're looking for feedback on this from, from our, you, the congregation. Right now, we got all that stuff, the, the smart board and the white boards are on the uh, west wall of the basement on this side. And that kind of not really logistically set up too well because once we start the meeting, whether it's Bible class or anything, the entrance to the basement is right there in the front where everybody is facing. And if someone wants to come in late, it's kind of conspicuous when they come in late. Oh, look, Harry's late again, okay? Or if they, someone has to get up and go to the restroom and they're sitting back here, the restroom's also on that wall. So, that, oh, Harry with his, you know, small, his enlarged prostate has to go to the bathroom again, okay? So it's kind of conspicuous anytime someone has to go to the kitchen or go to the restroom. Sometimes they have to pass in front of pastor. And so what we've just received, uh, Risen Savior, through grant money, I believe, just received six smart boards. And two of those, I believe, are being uh, going to be used in the basement down here because, of course, Risen Saver uses our basement for a number of different activities as well. These are really nice, large smart boards, and we're going to be installing those down in the basement. We don't want to install them on the east wall again for the reasons I've already mentioned. It'd be much better to install those on the west wall. Excuse me. We want to be on the east wall, not on the west wall. So we want to move them all. I got my directions mixed up. Okay, north, south, right. Okay. So this is the uh, west wall. We want to move everything over to the east wall. And because then uh, our meetings will not be disrupted by people coming in and out or having to pass. Uh, they'll be passing behind the, the, the convened meeting instead of in front of us. But there's a problem. That wall is not vacant. That wall has portraits of our pastors on it. That wall has pictures of our confirmation classes from the past on it. Now, I'm excited about the growth of our church and all the improvements that have been made. We have this new screen up here. We're going to have another screen on, up here as soon as we get the wiring in place. But I'm also, anybody who knows me, you know I'm a historian, and I'm a real stickler about the history of our church as well. I've been involved in the writing and the history of our church a couple of times. So I don't want to do away with the past. So those pictures present kind of a dilemma, the confirmation pictures. They're very interesting to look at. And we've had people that are not members that come down during a funeral or they come down uh, uh, during a wedding or whatever, a baptism. And they, they find those pictures very interesting as well. 
And so we don't want to do away with those pictures. So here's our options right now. And I'm going to give you a couple options that we've thought of. And Will Dallenbach and I are, are, are working on this right now. And so you give us your feedback. But right now, the options are this. One, we could take those pictures down and put a bunch of screws into the west wall and put them back up on that side. But uh, we think there's a better way to do that. We don't want to eliminate the pictures. We want them to still be available to the congregation and visitors to look at. And, and uh, you understand that since the church was founded in, in 1942, there's been 82 confirmation classes, 82. And I don't know if you're upset if you were confirmed after uh, 1967, but your picture's not down there. There's only 25 confirmation classes down there. So to do justice to all the confirmation classes, we should have 82 confirmation pictures down there all the way up until 2024. That's not really conducive. I mean, that's not going to work. We're going to run out of wall space. So there are 57 more classes that could be pictured and archived. And here's what some of our options right now, besides putting the pictures back up on the, on the west wall. One of the ideas is to get a volume, take the pictures down and, and preserve them in a really nice, heavy-duty volume, a book with a really classy cover on it. And we would not only include just the uh, 25 classes that are already on that wall, but also we would include the other 57 classes since that time, and they would all be in a book. And anyone who wanted to visit could come and look at those. Another option would be a uh, digital picture frame, a digital picture frame. You might have some of these at home where you can put pictures into the memory and they can go flash picture after picture. They can be on a timer or you can actually move from one click from one picture to the next. That's another option. So we could have all of our confirmation classes archived and, and, and instead of having just the 25 down there and also save this wall space for other important things that we may want to use those for. Um, and then, uh, so we're looking for, for input right now on that. And those are the two options that we've come up with right now. And then, of course, we have our four portraits, our three portraits right now, of our three pastors uh, in the pastors to church. We have a very humble pastor and Pastor Borman. He says, no, you don't need my kisser up there, but we would like to have his picture up there as well. And uh, we'll have to try to convince him to do that. But we think maybe those pictures should stay somewhere up. But we're thinking the confirmation pictures would really be a nice way to keep them in a really classy, a heavy uh, bound volume on a special table or a, or a pedestal. So those are our options right now. And we want to uh, make sure that you have an understanding and that you have a input into this. So please feel free to walk up to Will Dallenbach or myself or any other council members and give us your input on that and your feelings on that. And also, we have a council meeting coming up, I mean, a, a congregational meeting coming up on the 13th of October. And it might be a good time to also talk about that or discuss that as well. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Have a great week. Okay, so everybody's excused now. I just want a few, a few volunteers.